til, at vi skal vide rigtig gerne velkommen til Don Rosa, der er amerikansk forfatter og forfatter og øh, tegner. Han har i årene øh, 1980 til 2008 og tegner forfatter bag Amazand Universet, som han overtog efter Karl Barks. Specielt har hovedkarakter eller fokuspunktet været onkel Joachim, som også har hovedbeton i hans hovedværk her i det Joachim. Nu skal I opleve ham i samtale med Kåre Brink Poulsen om hans lange liv med Ong Jørgen og alle de andre kendte ender fra hende liv. Rigtig god fornøjelse. Thank you very much and welcome all of you. This will be in English. Hopefully um, we won't be using a lot of long words, so it will be understandable. And welcome to you, Doc. Well, thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Always glad to be on the the land of the, the duck band, the Marx band, <laughs> rather than America. <laughs> and, and, and how have, I mean, we've been sitting out there for three days now. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you tired of, of uh, you know, making tickets? Yeah, I never get tired of uh, seeing, meeting duck fans. I was in Italy uh, three weeks ago, and there it was 10 hours nonstop, every day for five days. So I never get tired. I can't explain it. It's, I'm a fan, and they're fans, and uh, if they want my autograph, I, I'm always very flattered. I never get tired. And, and when, when we do it, I get stupid. <laughs> my brain gets tired. I think adrenaline must uh, affect your, your bodily functions, but not your brain. So. And, and, and all the, our, 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 our pastors today, all these people in line, what, what do you think they're actually there for? I realize they, they, they get the, well, a lot of them had no, idea, had no idea I was going to be here, so I don't know how they advertised it, but they, uh, they're just walking walking through the room and they, they see me, they see a long line and they see me sitting there signing books. But, uh, but of course, other ones came uh, just to see me. They uh, read the websites where the things are announced and uh, I'm glad to see you. You know what? You know, anybody who want. And of course, there's a few people who uh, just get in the long line and they I guess they don't have no idea who I am, but they <laughs> must be a good idea. So they got something. We always have something free to give. Some, sometimes little kids are attracted to the long line, and they, uh, you know, bits of trash that they got out of the garbage. <laughs> so we give them something. So it's, it's kind of insulting to sign trash. But, uh, we'll sign a postcard or something. But they get it from the books, so then it's perfect. Um, so and now they're here. What, what do you think they're here for? You met, you met all of them probably. They, 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 oh, they, it could be. Uh, I met a lot of people. Well, we'll see what they're here for. You can uh, ask some questions, but I hope uh, at some point you can ask questions from the audience because I'm always curious to see what, what they want to know. I think that that's the idea today that we'll ask some questions really? about okay. your life. Uh, well, whatever they want to know. I, I know that uh, people have asked me to, uh, they say, well, you, they want me to give a talk. And I said, I don't give talks. I don't know what people want to know. They have to tell me. I said, I'd rather do question and answer. And they'll find out if they ask me a simple question. After a few minutes, they'll say, that's enough. That's OK. I didn't, I didn't want to know all that. That is a simple question. So uh, I, like I said, I don't give talks, but I usually give answers that are far too long. <laughs> as long as I know somebody wants to know. Then. Let's, let's get you started. Because I mean, you, I, mean, I was asked to, to talk to you about your, your life you know, in, in sort of working and, and uh, drawing and telling stories about dark universe. Uh, what, what has been sort of the most important turning point in your career, in your life? Uh, what, what, because I mean, you're at a point now where, where you stopped uh, telling these stories. Okay, 13 years ago, that's at the point. Uh, what's the most important part of, uh, well, let's see, let's kind of go back to a long story. I was always a fan of these comics. Well, uh, Marx and Stapps were the best-selling comics in the history of the United States, just as they still are, I think, in most of the world outside of North America. Uh, but they disappeared from North America uh, in the early 70s, and uh, I, uh, but even if they were still going, I knew uh, that I was going to take over the family construction company. I was born into a pretty wealthy family that uh, my grandfather had started a successful construction company when he moved to America and uh, immigrated uh, around 1890, 1899. From Italy. From a small town in uh, north of Venice. Uh, I think he got on a train in New York City and he ran out of money in Louisville, Kentucky. 
just got off at, it was thrown off the train, so that's where he started his life. I wish he had had enough money to get to Orlando, Florida, and bought land or something. <laughs> He got thrown off in Louisville, uh, but he started a successful uh, tile and terrazza. That's what the Italians either did that or they opened pizza parlors in, uh, in America. But uh, so I always knew that that's what I was going to do. I was uh, I was the only male Rosen, so uh, I knew I was. Uh, I still went to college. I, I took civil engineering. There's no reason to. I didn't need to know anything about civil engineering, but I. I think my uh, father and my uncle figured I would meet the future building contractors in, uh, in the Civil Engineering College in Kentucky, University of Kentucky. So they figured that would be a uh, good business for me. They didn't count on the fact that I was an introvert and I only liked to watch TV and read comics. So I didn't make any friends. That's all I did was sit around making my own comics. But I knew that's what I was gonna do, run the family construction company, uh, since I was highly qualified for that, for being the boss's only male <laughs> uh, but what happened in, uh, uh, like I said, these comics disappeared from America in the early 70s. But in, uh, I think, 1987, a few uh, actual friends of mine, comic fans and comic collectors, actually got the license to publish, every time I say Disney comics, I have to go like this, because Disney has nothing whatsoever to do with them. They didn't create the characters. Karl Marx did that. They didn't have anything to do with the writing or the art publication and the distribution that was all done by freelance writers and artists working for totally independent but licensed publishers. Uh, so uh, some friends of mine, like three friends, actually got the license to publish Disney comics for North America simply because nobody else wanted it. By then comics sold pitifully bad in America and they sell much, much worse now. Um, and uh, I saw this uh, at the newsstands comic shops. I was uh, still a comic collector. That's a lot of people don't know. I've got one of uh, America's biggest comic book collections. Not just Disney comics, everything. Because I've always been a lover of comic books. Primarily because I love Marx's comics. Uh, but I loved all the others that that led to. But uh, I called up this friend of mine uh, and I told him that I was born to write and draw one Uncle Scrooge adventure. I'd actually already done it in college. I'd, had a daily newspaper strip with uh, uh, my characters, uh, and uh, uh, later turned it into a, my first Uncle Scrooge comic for this this company. But I told them I was born to write and draw one Uncle Scrooge adventure, and it was my manifest destiny, which I'd always thought, but just one. I, I never knew I'd make a uh, career out of it for the next uh, couple of decades. So I, I did that one, and uh, went back to the construction company, uh, figuring jobs and uh, so forth. It was a pretty important telephone call, wasn't it? Oh yes, it was uh, even more important than later. Don't we maybe get to if you uh, ask the right questions, but that was the important <laughs> I don't believe you thought you'd uh, find out what you want to know. But I guess that's, uh, what was the original question? <laughs> what was the most important one? one? Yeah, I guess that's when I saw that first that was a totally fun. comic book. Yeah, I remember that what caught my attention especially was uh, the, first uh, continuation of our monthly anthology comic that started in 1940, uh, Walt Disney's Comics and Stories. That was our monthly, we never had weekly comics, but we had monthly comics. Uh, that's when we're, Mark's always did the 10-page Donald Duck adventure, uh, which made him famous around the world. Uh, but I saw the continuation of that series, what the number, I don't know, 400 or something, and uh, it was a Mark's cover that I'd never seen. I knew I had a full collection of all of Mark's covers. So that really attracted my attention. It turned out it was uh, worked by a, a Dutch artist named Don Gibbs, who could mimic not just Mark's style, but he's a, he's a real artist. He could just mimic styles. I can only draw like Don Rosen, but he could just mimic anybody's style. Hmm. So he mimicked it so perfectly that he fooled me. I saw a, a Mark's cover that I've never seen. And so uh, that, yeah, that's when I uh, contacted my friend who I found that uh, the editor of this, this new tiny publisher. The smallest Disney publisher, forgot that part, the smallest Disney publisher in the world, the United States of America. So um, it, it led to, amongst other things, uh, this uh, biography of. It led to that. It led to me and you and me sitting here on the stage yeah. 30 mm. years later. Yeah. And, and I mean, everyone know 
Elvis, of course, Scrooge. Um, he used to be sort of sidetracked. Right? Everybody outside of North America. In North America, they, they have no memory of there ever being comic books like this. Well, most like Americans them. don't even know where there's comic books. They're only sold in a couple of stores in each city. And they sell like Batman and Spider-Man that hear so much about, sell like 20,000 copies over all of North America. When I was a kid, these comics sold 3 million copies a month. And now the comics sell like 10 or 20,000. And those are, uh, those are the ones bought by the comic shops. We don't even know how few were bought by the actual readers. And the ones that are bought by the actual readers, we don't even know how many are read. You know, they put them in bags and uh, think they're going to get rich selling them someday. <laughs> and they, they want to read them because they're not going to increase them. So. I marked it out. I'll zone out on this. Start answering so many other questions I've heard that I'm clear of. But yeah, I just saw those on the stand. And, uh, so this, actually, when, when you read these uh, stories about sort of the, the, his past, uh, Scrooge, it's sort of kind of a, a history lesson in many ways, isn't it? Well, I mean, you have been going through a lot of research. Yeah, but that's just to please myself, uh, as I've been explaining to people all day when they talk about the details and the work. I just I did this to please myself. You know, it's uh, I never made good money at it, but not because the paint was not excellent. Egmont pays excellent wages, but they don't tell me to put all the detail in there. You can make good money doing this if you know how to work swiftly and efficiently and just uh, you're working off on somebody else's script, so you're not trying to embellish it, especially if, uh, I mean, I'm my own I write what I draw and I draw what I write, so I'm especially interested in making both aspects as good as I can. If you're drawing somebody else's script, you just uh, put as much work into it as need to tell the story. I was entertaining myself, uh, and that's what I think, uh, well apparently that's what people like about my work is they can tell I was working a lot harder than the pay uh, indicated because I was having fun. I, only, I tell interviewers that, that it seemed to me that because it was a mystery to me, it was a surprise to me that my work was so popular. Because I'm a comic fan, I can tell good artwork when I see it. I can tell uh, uh, my work was like what was in Mad Magazine. That was the other thing my sister bought that I grew up on. It was Donald Duck comic books, Karl Marx comics, and Mad Magazine. So I used to buy all the comics and read them. Yeah. Well, no, she she made me borrow them, and uh, she gave me a small stack at a time, and I couldn't have more until I returned. Uh, did you know uh, Karl Marx at the moment, at, 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 at that time, did you know there was a person called uh, Karl Marx, or did you figure that out later? Uh, well, as, uh, only as a comic book collector, we, were, we learned that around 1970, when I uh, started getting uh, fan magazines, and started working for fan magazines. Uh, then there were a few uh, collectors out in California who, who got his address somewhere, and uh, visited him, and <laughs> so then it was known that he was, uh, a good artist was Karl Marx, and that spread, but only through the uh, among comic book collectors. And that's still the only people in America who know who Karl Marx is is the old comic book collectors. Even the new comic book collectors, like I said, they don't. Uh, when we started to say that before, we uh, Americans don't even know uh, where to go and buy a Batman or a Spider-Man comic because they're not sold on you know every news kiosk like comics still are around the rest of the world. So they see lots of movies and TV shows and see all the toys and the games and so on, but they don't know where comic books come from. But they've never even heard of uh, Donald Duck or Uncle Scrooge comics. They think that all comes from the DuckTales TV show, even people that are 40 years old. They have no idea that there's ever been comics. That's why I, I do go to uh, American comics festivals, uh, uh, which I keep telling people here who are standing in line uh, here in Italy, like, six hours, seven hours just to get an autograph. And I can't do any drawings for anybody. So just come to see me in America sometime. And come and sit down with me and I keep drawings for you all day for free. <laughs> uh, and, and beg you to sit behind the booth with me and keep me company because it gets lonely. <laughs> I'm serious. It's, uh, any, anybody who comes all the way from Europe, and they do that a lot when I'm on the East Coast at a show. People will fly all the way from Europe just to get my autograph and turn around and fly back. When the, when the, Airfares are cheap, uh, but if anybody does that, I'll say, please stay here with me, talk to me, keep your company. <laughs> and that also shows them how few fans there are in America. 
The most important thing I have on my table with all the prints is a, a sign I had to make it professionally uh, made so it didn't attract attention. It just says, no, sorry, this is not updated. And I give them like a two or three sentence explanation, very concise explanation of who Karl Marx is and who, how popular these topics are around the world. But of course, Americans don't read that far, they just read, so that's too much text. So they stop, <laughs> they stop right there on the first page. You see, no Duckdale. No, this is not Duckdale. And then they look at it and say, well, it's still not bad. Because <laughs> they think it's a cheap imitation of Duckdale. Uh, in Europe, it's different. I mean, oh, sure, yeah. Finland go for soap. I mean, Denmark, I'm sh I mean, the lines are so long. And, and we are in a book fair now, and I, and I think a lot of people here, when they started reading, that was. Oh, I can't tell you how many people say they uh, they learn to read uh, on my stories. Of course, I know they mean all the Dutch stories that are so popular, Karl Marx stories, but I know what they mean. And uh, and they're fun, but but then somehow, I mean, Scrooge and also Donald, I mean, they're universal characters. Well, and, and yeah, uh, things that I notice between uh, American comics fans are it's, it's totally different. You know, the whole concept of comics and entertainment culture is different in America. Uh, but it makes me feel good that uh, I could easily see how duck bands in Europe, this is part of their life. They, from their earliest memory, like, like me, we read Karl Marx's duck comics and the other characters and the other comic civilizations. Americans might uh, not find out about comic book collecting until they're 13 or 15 or 16. And then they find out it's, you can make money on it, so they, they get interested in it. Uh, so it's not part of their life. You know, they say, well, this is cool, or this is, uh, Batman is real cool, or anyone. But uh, I've got a completely different reaction. It's like, it's part of their life. It's, I, I can't even know, I don't even know how to respond to some of the compliments I get. Uh, and it's, and they're great fans in Scandinavia. Uh, Denmark, uh, Sweden, Norway, Finland especially. But uh, because uh, I'm noticing now uh, that uh, about 20 years ago, they, uh, I guess in 1997, they did lots of Life of, Life of Scrooge collections. That was uh, Scrooge's 50th anniversary. So those appeared here in Scandinavia, but they also appeared in uh, France and in Italy. And uh, as, uh, as long as I've been a, a very popular because of arcs here in uh, Scandinavia, now I'm that, I'm that popular in Italy and France, and it's, uh, I know they're no bigger fans than they are in Scandinavia, but they're much more emotional, <laughs> which is really interesting. And they get, they get hysterical when they see this. <laughs> Broke men cry, but, but I know it's because this is part of their life, and I, I know it's, but Karl Marx felt too. These things that uh, people read from their earliest memory. And in Danish, I mean, the whole universe is called Alessandro, or not, but, but you're into Scrooge the most. Why is he more interesting than Donald? I get asked that a lot. Because always in Europe, uh, it's been Donald Duck Weekly, and Scrooge is just a backup character. He's the story in the back of the issue. In America, it has nothing to do with this being a character that's wealthy. There's nothing to do with that. But I mentioned before we had the monthly, the flagship title was uh, the Don. Uh, Walt Disney's Comics and Stories, which always, virtually every issue for 25 years, had a 10-page Donald Duck story by Karl Marx. Brilliant stories, but they were only 10 pages. And some people prefer those, but... Uh, and then we had the Donald Duck monthly comic, or bi-monthly comic. And those, when they first started in the late 40s, they were all by Karl Marx, but then he turned those over to other artists. So we had that. But then, starting in 1952, after uh, Scrooge McDuck had been around for five years or so, uh, he, that character had become so popular that the editors decided, not Disney, the editors at Dell Comics decided to give this uh, new character his own title. Uh, and of course, Karl Marx, the creator, would redesign the character. In the first like five appearances of Scrooge McDuck, he was a villain. At first, he was wealthy. He wasn't super wealthy. He was just wealthy. Uh, and uh, I think for the next uh, five years, he'd, uh, usually he'd be a, a villain in the story, just a bad guy. So in 1952, anyway, he, uh, in modern terms, he rebooted the character. He gave him a costume that 
the, the same top hat and the same frock coat in every story, and he gave him a different personality, and especially in the early issues of Uncle Scrooge, uh, gave him a history. He talked about things he did in the 1880s and 1890s. I think that's what really appealed to me in, the, in these stories, made him a much deeper character than Donald Duck. Who was so his ancestors uh, come Yeah, he talked about his ancestors. And, uh, uh, and lived in the American, tried to live in the American dream, or what was really to build so I guess that's what George was thinking. By how, by how well. Yeah, that probably appealed to me too, uh, maybe later on, when I grew a little older, and found out that's what my grandfather had done, exactly the same thing. He'd come to America when he was about the same age as Scrooge was, like a teenager, and uh, started from scratch, and just built uh, a successful company. Failing and failing and failing, and then finally succeeded. I think he failed, I think he just always just succeeded. It was easy. Uh, which direction was I going with that? <laughs> uh, we're talking about uh, so the, the, the difference in the character of Scrooge and Don. Oh, yeah. Don lives so, uh, in the now, and he's just. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's what I was talking about. Why is Scrooge is to us the most important character? So we, uh, yeah, in this new title, Uncle Scrooge Comics, starting in 1952, uh, they were all, for the first 65 issues, uh, for the next five or six years, uh, next 15 years. Uh, they were all bark stories, all long adventure stories, and Donald Duck was his sidekick. He was just the comic sidekick, you know, he just followed Scrooge around. So to us, Scrooge McDuck was the main character, and Donald Duck was just a, a funny slapstick side character. And that's why people are, are initially were disappointed that I seemed to think Scrooge McDuck was the main character. Uh, now they tell me that a lot of people prefer Scrooge. People have been telling me that. And I said, well, what changed? And they said, well, you were doing Uncle Scrooge. And I said, oh, well, shit. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're right. I think it's more interesting. Yeah. Because I was told, without being able to read European comics, that uh, after Barks quit, uh, this is just what other you know, collectors or readers have told me, that they made Scrooge just a greedy character. And uh, no sympathy and no uh, background. and and. Uh, but I brought that Barksian uh, atmosphere back. I don't even, uh, looking back at uh, Barks' early stories, I think you can, uh, if, you, if you know which stories were his earliest Uncle Scrooge stories, like the first 10 issues of Uncle Scrooge comics, it, you get the sense that the editors told him to back off on this. He was making them too adult. He was talking too much about history, and uh, he was putting too, realistic emotions into the characters, because Marx really didn't really want to be doing Donald Duck comics. He wanted to be like every every other cartoonist in those days, he wanted to be doing a newspaper strip. That's where the money was. Comic books in those days were considered hack work. Uh, Marx was, uh, was he wasn't different than other people in those days. He'd be different than people now. He had to work at it. Whatever his job was, he did the best he could at it even though it uh, did not command respect. That's, uh, at least in America, that's completely different now. Nobody has respect in their, their work. They just want to get paid more for it and not let anybody else into the country who's going to do it better and cheaper. Uh, but uh, it seemed to me that the early issues uh, seemed to concentrate on Marx as uh, Scrooge as a, a more sympathetic character and a misunderstood character and that the money wasn't as, as important to him as uh, adventure and the uh, historical settings, and, uh, but they talked a lot about his past, you know, lots of stories were based on uh, things his ancestors had done or that he had done as a youth. So that was one difference uh, of those old stories, and that's why uh, Scourge was always the more interesting character to Americans, my age. Now he's, like I say, forgotten except for the uh, kiddies TV shows. So the, the I mean, the, the difference between reading these comics and reading about superheroes um, for kids today, what, I mean, what difference do you think that makes in, in, in what? Well, um, kids don't read these comics in America. These comics, and no comics really like them exist. Because, and now you get into a really complicated subject, but what happened in America was when comics failed in the 70s, Dell Comics, that's a comic uh, company that invented Uncle Scrooge, that Marks worked for, reinvented Donald Duck. 
all done by Dell Comics, a division of Western Publishing, that's the biggest comic book publisher in American history. But they published lots of other things. It was a huge company. Uh, they published uh, magazines, books, <coughs> crossword puzzle books, you know, anything you saw in the newsstands or grocery stores. They even did uh, board games, anything that was made out of paper, cardboard. But they had, they were a huge publisher. They uh, weren't like DC and Marvel, who had to create their own characters. And we have uh, so many other companies in those days. Dell Comics simply went out and paid for the licenses of everything. They had not just Disney, they had Warner Brothers, they had Hanna-Barbera, they had MGM, Columbia, any, any animated cartoon you can possibly name, uh, dozens of other animated cartoons companies. They had every TV show, they had every movie. They would publish uh, comic books based on like every movie that came out. Uh, so they had the money, and they were best-selling comic books, and they were very well produced, excellent comics. But when comics stopped selling in the 70s, like I said, this, this is a company that uh, multifaceted. They published, they just said, well, screw these comics. They just dropped them. So the Disney comics disappeared. Uh, and all of the children's comics disappeared. That's what you call these children's comics. Their comics appeal on many levels. And uh, even DC and Marvel, when we were going to comic book conventions in the late 60s and early 70s, they were telling us uh, they were going to be out of business within five years because comics were selling so poorly. And especially in a country as huge as North America and uh, so widespread, and people who live, they're sort of the, the populations in Europe are more concentrated in, in cities, I think, than spread out uh, in suburbs like we were in America. It's a whole over. Middle Ages, I guess. Uh, in America, it's just the opposite. Everybody's spread out. So they were still putting 20 copies of every published comic on every newsstand in America. And they might sell one out of each 20, or none out of each 20. And the way uh, magazine distribution works is the news dealer would get a full refund on all of those unsold comic books. So, so that was uh, a disaster waiting to happen, and it happened in the in the 70s, nobody, the stores wouldn't even put comics out because there weren't enough buyers for them. Uh, so to help you explain why these comics disappeared and they'll never come back in America, uh, DC and Marvel were failing, failing, and all of the other, it's only like two or three other companies, maybe just two other companies left. Uh, and then again, friends of mine, like the same, maybe the same people who uh, had the, uh, later had the Gladstone, the, the got the Disney license for comics, they convinced the DC and Marvel that instead of putting 20 copies of every comic on every the millions of newspaper stands and then having to refund the money, they should go to these comic shops that were popping up and say, uh, well, in, in three months we're going to publish a Spider-Man comic. And this is going to be the writer and this is going to be the artist. Uh, how many will you buy? In one store, I'd say five copies. In another bigger store, I'd say 50 copies, 75 copies. And DC or Marvel would publish that many and sell them to the stores, not return them. Now you're in the, now you're in the realm of printing money. They, they, they couldn't fail. And that's the only reason comics lasted from 1975 to about, say, 2005, when we rescued them, really, because the sales still plummeting. That's, uh, that's why the silly American uh, superhero comics would constantly start over with number one or do a miniseries because the failing sales would bump up a little bit, uh, bump up a little bit. But they at least held on. They never knew this would happen. But uh, CGI computers came along and they could do superhero movies and superhero uh, games and superhero TV shows and superhero toys. And also you had the, uh, just the culture of what sort of movies people would go see, so they lasted long enough, so the popular, pop entertainment saved them. And the sales of comic books in America are still pathetically bad, but they're making trillions of dollars off of this cheap entertainment. That, uh, so that's, that's why they lasted. And that's why the, the comics that the rest of the world reads is never gonna make it way back into American culture, because Americans know that the only thing to read in a comic book is a superhero. 
That's one of the sad things when I'm uh, mm -hmm. at an American show, sitting there watching people walking past, walking past. Uh, actually, he's got one of the, uh, these prints that I have. I did the original print for a European friend. It's uh, like Scrooge and Donald dressed as Batman and Robin. I did it for my friend because I knew he was a Donald Duck fan making fun of Batman. Uh, but uh, I never would draw that for an American uh, uh, show because I know he was a Batman fan and making fun of Uncle Scrooge. But I'll have that same print in America, uh, along with all these superhero parodies, with Donald Duck as fresh as these uh, superheroes. But uh, seriously, the sad thing is the families will walk past, and uh, the kid with the family, uh, maybe seven or eight years old or younger, three or four years old, and I've got all these Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge prints, like he's selling here, but I'll have this one with Batman and Robin. That's the only thing the kid sees. He points to that, because he's been brought up by 30-somethings and 40-somethings that uh, that's the only thing they read when they were kids, superheroes. So that's the only thing he sees is Batman and Robin. He doesn't see Donald Duck or Uncle Scrooge, because he knows he's not supposed to read that. That would never happen in Denmark. Uh, that would never happen in Europe or South America. Before we open up the room, the last question, because I mean, that would probably be what the question you won't get. Are, are they ducks or are they humans? Well, they're obviously humans. I've always known that. And if they're humans, why are they ducks? <laughs> I don't see ducks. I see humans. When I see Daffy Duck, I see a duck. He's, uh, my sister had Daffy Duck comics. He was naked. He flew around in the air. People shot at him with guns. Uh, Scrooge and Donald had uh, wore clothes. They had jobs. They worried about taxes. Uh, I thought Mark said they were humans. He said they were caricatures of human beings. I mean, I, I don't see a duck when I see that. We used to, uh, Asterix doesn't look like a human being. He's got, he's about this tall and he's got a giant nose. But we know he's a human being. He's got this funny orange thing on his face and he's white, but I know he's a human being. I think about, uh, for example, if Scrooge or Donald were in some, I don't know, some situation, some trap, and they needed a feather to save their life. I don't know where they get it. I used to make jokes. Uh, the first stories I did, sometimes they make reference to their, their web feet. And when they reprint those stories, I have them rework those because it was just a cheap joke then. But then I realized some people mistakenly actually think these are talking animals. So I gotta make sure they, they realize these are people. Let's, let's hear questions from the room, because I, I know you get emails every day, um, and, and you can spend hours asking us. Ask, uh, let's well, hear some uh, Thank you. I have a question about a story. It's called um, The Dream of a Lifetime, which you wrote. And there is some similarities in that story to the film Inception. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, in the story, the Beagle Boys try to enter Scrooge's streets to steal the coat to do his uh, money bin. And I'm just wondering, what inspired your story, and do you think your story inspired Inception? Uh, okay, there's two interesting answers to that. Uh, that story was the, the only full story, I think, uh, that was suggested to me by a reader. Uh, now, writers frequently, uh, and even publishers, tell readers, uh, do not send us ideas. Because if somebody sends any of us an idea, it's our property. We don't have to pay anybody for it. And I don't want to be put in that position. But this uh, young, I think it was a French guy, sent me this idea where uh, it was just a, uh, just like one sentence. He said, what if uh, Scrooge uh, was uh, grieving and uh, he suggested Jairo Gerlitz would have a machine that would help the Beagle Boys enter his mind and try to get the combination to his uh, money bin, his money hole. Uh, but somebody sent me that, that idea, and I right away I warned him. I said, you shouldn't, shouldn't send ideas to these. And I said, but that sounds like an interesting idea. And uh, I said, uh, if you let me do it, uh, uh, well, I'll, I will do it. Or, no, I said, if you let me do it, I'll give you some artwork, I'll draw your picture. Or I'll announce your name as the co-writer. I said, you probably won't get paid by the publisher, but uh, any more than I get paid. But, uh, I, but he didn't want his name used. I thought that was curious. Uh, but he said I could hide his initials in the first panel, or 
or maybe I suggested that because I always had the DUCK in the first panel. So, uh, all those, all those, all those. well, yeah, was, uh, I think once or twice I penciled it in and then I didn't see it. I hit it so well that I didn't see it when I inked it. <laughs> but uh, so I did this story, and it was a, uh, I thought it was one of the best stories I've ever written because uh, for a time travel story, I love, I've always loved time travel stories. Uh, but this was a story where you didn't have to waste uh, like three or four pages in between going from one time to another. It was just happened from one panel to the next because it was all a dream. Do you think Christopher uh, Nolan stole it? Or was well, it? I'll get to that. <laughs> uh, the first thing was that apparently this guy stole it from another, from another movie called The Cell. Because I was watching a movie uh, on, I don't know, on HBO when I was still getting those channels called The Cell, C-E-L-L, -L, and it was exactly the same idea. It was a doctor who was uh, injecting uh, other people's mentalities or personalities into uh, a patient's brain to help cure him, or uh, I don't even remember all the details. And then I think I got on the internet and looked up when this Cell movie was released in France. It was like a month before this guy sent me this uh, idea. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure he stole that, and that's why he didn't want his name. And then, to get to your question, uh, uh, the, the internet went viral in, uh, once upon a time about the, uh, this movie Inception being copied from an Uncle Scrooge story. Now, the saddest thing about that is uh, this is one of these people who thought all the stories come from Walt Disney, so my name was never mentioned, so I, I missed out being uh, mentioned in that uh, uh, internet phenomenon. But I read that, and by then I'd stopped going to movies and theaters. Uh, I've got a gigantic TV at home, and I watch Blu-ray discs, so it's, uh, and you know, uh, every movie comes out on this in like three months, and so there's no sense in going to a theater anymore, not like uh, when I was a kid. So uh, I read it, I saw this uh, on the internet, and uh, that this movie was based on the Uncle Scrooge story that I got, and I'm thinking, well, oh, it's, it's a simple idea, but it's, you know, it's probably just a coincidence. And then again, uh, you, you still go to ask them call box, so it's different. Yeah. Uh, but then, three or four months later, it came out on this, and I watched it. And, whoa, this is really close. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not my property. If somebody's going to sue uh, the guy at the Disney, it's their property now, so I'll let them do that. I just have another question. I can't see unless I can. That's a lot of operation. Plus so I'm asking for Anthony, who's 10 years old and a big fan, and he'd like to ask you how you find your inspiration for your stories with Scrooge. Yes, every for Marx first, but any other comic I ever read or any. TV show I ever saw, or any movie I ever saw that I liked, or historical fiction I read. I don't know. I, uh, I, I know other writers uh, give cute answers. Uh, you know, how did you come up with that idea? They said, I could. <laughs> and he said, but this other idea was really, how did you come up with that? And he said, well, I could. <laughs> <laughs> I can't answer that. It's just it's the way writers' heads work. I do admit that uh, there's no new idea. There's just ways to combine old ideas. Even new inventions, no matter how new they are, everything's already been invented, you just find ways to combine them. And uh, all my best stories was I just do research and history and just keep writing down facts. Uh, and the story would come and I'd see how these facts, I could fit them together like uh, dovetail them together. And sometimes it would be so obvious that I could create an interesting story purely out of actual facts that I didn't even feel like I could take credit for it. It's right there in the books. Nobody just ever thought of combining it in that, that way. That was fun. I thought it was really a challenge to make up an interesting story using only facts. Of course, nobody, everybody thought of making everything up because they, they only see talking nuts. So <laughs> that's one thing I like about these books. I can write a text show people that they're not, not making this crap up. It's all right there in the history books. Hello? Um, I just 
one thing that always interested me with the Scrooge character was this kind of conflict between what he felt he was supposed to do with his life and I guess his emotions towards it, or like uh, Goldie or otherwise his family. Um, what, did, what did you, because there, there's a scene in the King of the Klondike where he discovers the huge, the egg, right? And this is where he has to decide, does he really want to be rich or not? Or the goose egg, right? Yeah, the goose egg, right? And, and I just, do you have anything to say about this, this character? Because I feel like he has a lot of depth to him. I think he does too, and that, that very panel came from, like I was telling you, Mark's, his earliest stories of Uncle Scrooge were really deep. And that's where I get my, all my inspiration, from his early stories. And the first story he did about when he rebooted, when he redesigned Uncle Scrooge, the story was called Only a Poor Old Man, and it starts out with uh, Scrooge telling Donald in his office, telling uh, Donald about all of the adventures he had as a youth and uh, how he made his money. And, Scrooge, and Donald's always telling him that this money's just a, a lot of nuisance to him. He's just, he has to constantly worry about protecting it. I think that's what's going on in the, in the early panels. Uh, Scrooge is running around trying to catch mice that are eating up uh, $1 bills, or there's moths that are eating up money somehow. And then he has the adventure in the middle of the Beagle Boys. Uh, this is the first time the Beagle Boys uh, are shown in their finished form. And they, uh, but he has the whole adventure, and then the last, this also is a story uh, where he hides his money in a lake. And it has the, but I, I, I love this comic as a kid. I never knew it was the first issue of Uncle Scrooge. Uh, even if it had, if it had a number one on it, as a kid, I wouldn't have paid, paid, paid any attention. I didn't know what all that information was on the bottom of the first page. But even if I had, this was number 386, because it was part of a Dell series of uh, tryout, one-shot comics. Anyway, I didn't know this was the first issue of uh, Uncle Scrooge, but uh, it had this dam breaking scene. Mm -hmm. It's a half panel of uh, this dam breaking and all this water and money washing uh, down in such a graceful, gorgeous way. I think it's the greatest action panel ever in comics. And that's just a side note on this great story. But the best part of the story was at the end, he's beaten the Beagle Boys, and he's paid off Donald and Huey Dewey and Louie 30 cents an hour. Uh, and, and he says, uh, now you, you should learn how to uh, appreciate life and the, the, uh, the glory of hard work and, uh, and profit. And they're walking away. They're going to go spend their money on some ice cream sodas. And he says, uh, uh, he says, For, uh, you don't realize how much trouble all your money is to you. It's, you never have any rest. You, rest. you never appreciate any of it. And he says, no matter what you think, you're only a poor old man, which is the title of the story. And then comes the, the key. And the next panel, it's just Scrooge like this. It's the most potent panel I've ever seen in a comic. You can see he's thinking. What is he thinking? He's thinking, was he right? Has he wasted his life? And then in the last panel, he throws his head down. He says, Bob, no man is poor who can do what he wants to once in his life. And he says, and I like to burrow through my money like a porpoise and dive in it, dive in it like a porpoise, burrow through it like a gopher. Toss it up in the air and it hit me on the head. And that's where I got that uh, panel from. It's the same thing. Does he really want to be rich? I, I really stole that right from that Marx. It's just a question does he want to be rich? And Scrooge is thinking in the Marx story, is he happy being rich? And I always uh, try to bring out that he's probably not happy being rich. And so in, in my stories, I think, when he's, uh, he was fooling himself, that he'd rather not be rich. And the Donald is happy. The Donald wants to be Scrooge, and Scrooge wants to be not. Hmm. If you want to uh, hear more stories from uh, Don, you can go out and stand in the line. Uh, I'm sure you're going to go back, signing. Um, yeah, right away. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, I think uh, Don is a bit annoyed that he has to take a break, and people are lining up right now. So, uh, now I'll we'll join the queue uh, and have uh, some more answers for all the great questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.